I've learned over the years, never turn this thing on until you're sure it's off and you're going to the restroom. <laughs> <laughs> I've never encountered that problem, but I've heard it happen and it's not pretty. And this is new, this is nice. Um, some of you know who I am, and you've seen me before, and, and I, others of you haven't. So, um, my ministry is uh, mental health in the science of mind. And um, my practice is divided into three parts. And by the way, Grant, uh, thanks for noticing. Yes, my hair reduction treatments have continued nicely, and they're almost completed, so. <laughs> At least somebody noticed that. Okay. Um, my, my practice is divided into three parts. I've got, you know, all the things that go with a regular therapy practice. And then I've also, because of COVID and they're having a hard time finding people willing to do it, I've been accepting reunification cases and had to reacquaint myself with uh, um, litig litigation, a part of the legal system, in which uh, it's not a search for truth, it's a search for win. And that's very different because if, Maybe you don't want to hurt anybody, but if your highest value is winning and you're losing, well, then pretty soon the rest of your values kind of get jetsons, right? Just overboard. And, and that's been, it just reminds me it's as bad as it ever was and, and worse. And, and people who can't find money for peace always seem to find money for war, which is, I think, go, is a societal problem at large. And then the third part of my practice is especially rewarding. Anybody here know anybody who had a divorce and it went badly and they wrecked all their money and they wrecked the kids? Anybody know anybody who did that? Well, I help people have more peaceful, more respectful divorce processes, either in colla under collaborative law, where even the opposing attorney makes sure that the other person's uh, client doesn't get the short end of the stick and everything's centered on the kids, like what are the needs of the kids, so it's always kids before money. And my, the parent organization I belong to, the International Association of Collaborative Professionals, has now spread to, um, I forget how many countries around the world, but there's more than 35,000 practitioners. And it's, uh, the effect of that work has come to the attention of the Nobel Committee in how um, much it serves families that the organization, our organization, has been nominated for Nobel Peace Prize this year. So. <clears throat> And, and I am presenting at their international conference in Toronto this October, so. Um, and I wrote a book about how divorce affects adult children if their parents are already grown up when they're divorced, and they always get overlooked. And, and you know, adult children are stakeholders in whatever happens to their parents, and that gets ignored over the years. So um, our book took four years to write and came out during COVID when it was even hard to get them delivered to Amazon. But nonetheless, it's, I still get uh, calls for interviews from uh, people around the world, and include at least Europe and, and the North America. So that's what's been, what's been happening. And so, but anyways, I moved 40 miles away, so it's hard to be here. Um, my talk today is on self-care and the importance of pleasure in our lives. And, and Judy said, boy, I'm glad you're doing pleasure because uh, I got to do something else. But I went back and I listened to Judy's talk and it was really nice and I decided to structure it the way she did. So I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna talk about and then we'll talk about it. So um, self-care, pleasure, um, music. How many people here are intensely dislike music? Can, anybody? <laughs> anybody think it's better than okay? <laughs> yeah, so right, right away this, this whole program started off with pleasure, it, we, we had. You know, some people singing, then we had the pro. You know, it's <laughs> and it's really nice. And I was talking to Melissa Suzanne, and it's, the other times I've spoken here, it just seems like she was the singer. And each time I felt like, why am I getting up here? She already did my sermon. Uh, and, and I had that same experience there. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. But at the same time, um, it was suggested that I acknowledge Juneteenth as the, the national holiday. And I, I think many of you, some of you may know the significance of that, but up years ago, most people probably didn't, unless they uh, belonged to a family that experienced that. But it, it seems the good 
people in Texas waited a couple of years before they let the slaves know that they were free. And, and what I've noticed in, in, in modern times is people act like when they talk about it, well, that was then and this is now. And, the, you know, like the big problem in slavery was that they didn't get paid. But that's not what the problem was. The problem was that you were chattel slaves. It was different than indentured servants. You, you inherited your parents' slavery status. That was new, that was different, that was bad. Um, generation gets set free that hasn't been a, allowed to even learn the basics of reading and writing for the most part. And then they're supposed to figure out what to do and they don't have a, any land and they don't have a place to go and they have to you know, try and find a way to survive and without the time to be able to catch up and teach the next generation, the next generation, and the next generation. And I'd be willing to bet that the people who lived under Jim Crow from the almost 100 years that it was in service, meaning segregation, you know, it, there was a, a brief period after the Civil War and then uh, every, uh, the people who, the insurrectionists got put back in office, they were allowed to run, they, they, they just changed everything, took away the little bit that the former slave had. And so at the very same time that the government was offering free land to European immigrants in the West, the people who were born there and had been freed got nothing. And the ones who got 10 acres and a mule got that taken away from them uh, in uh, about 1870, I believe. And then the Civil Rights Act, which still isn't completed, didn't come into, what, 1965? Anybody here alive in 1965? I mean, it doesn't seem like that long ago. And a lot of people don't know this, because I didn't, but as recently as the 1990s, um, Marines from Camp Pendleton used to go out and attack farmers in the fields in Vista and beat them up. And there were teenagers in that area that would go out in the fields and shoot at the farm workers because they'd been taught that they are somehow the other. And how many of you knew that, that that close to us in, 19, in the 1990s? And in, in 1998, I was driving across country, and the news was uh, some man had been tied to the back of a pickup truck by his ankles and dragged until his head came off. It was a black guy, of course. It was in East Texas. And the startling thing to me was there was no big national uproar as to how this could be happening in, in 1998. And so I'm bringing this up because Dr. Holmes said that we never call a half a loaf a loaf. I'm not saying things aren't better, I'm saying they're a lot better. So we're grateful for the half a loaf, but we want the whole loaf, right? Anybody want to settle for half a loaf? We want the whole loaf. Um, also, it's, it's when I was going to address the uh, June 16th, 18th, because uh, you know, it was suggested it gave me some leeway to go uh, a little farther. So we're gonna cover some things that I think have been delayed for our country for a long time, some honest conversations. And then we're gonna talk about how to get more, how to prepare yourself to accept more pleasure in your life, because that's really the whole key to the whole thing. Everything in life is from the inside out. Anybody here disagree with that? I mean, thoughts, everything that's created is preceded by a thought. And so if you have thoughts about pleasure or thoughts about your wholeness, recognizing that we all come from one source, then I think we would approach a lot of these problems very differently. We would approach them with compassion rather than polarization and seeking to see who can be the quickest and the best to, pun to punish whoever disagrees with us. And it seems to me that our country's kind of in that state right now. Would anybody agree with that? that? It's really hard for people to have civil conversations and they avoid these difficult conversations. And, and I was talking to some of my uh, practitioner friends who I've had a study group going for the last about six years, just to see if, if we thought people were ready for this. And, and unanimously I heard, yes, Bruce, you have a platform, use it. So, this is the platform. I, I have noticed that somewhere between two and maybe two and a half billion people around the planet don't have access to basic hygiene equipment, services. No running water, no, no soap, uh, outhouses or, or, or trenches, maybe not any sanitation at all. Now, to me, that sounds like a pretty big problem. Would you agree? 
I mean, we're not saying that things are perfect, but I mean, they are perfect, but they can always get better. And the things that aren't working to optimum as we evolve as a species, uh, some things are pretty obvious. And I think, you know, a third of the world's population not having access to sanitation is important for the rest of us to know because it's, it's been known since maybe the, at least the 1980s or 90s that when you have masses of people in, in crammed into spaces and they're malnourished and they're, they're doing bad w with their own health, it provides a perfect breeding ground for organisms that previously were not pathogenic to humans to morph into deadly diseases. And I remember uh, hearing that forecast from an environmentalist back in 1998 from Stanford University. And uh, when my friends and I went back and couldn't sleep that night, just he laid out, he said, you know, in the future, the next horrible disease is going to be 20 hours away in a plane, plane, um, a plane ride from some impoverished country in Asia or Africa. So these are not like, well, it's their problem, not our problem. We just had a big problem, right? And, and as a, a scientist once told me, just because you can do something doesn't mean you ought to. Okay, so just because you can create terrible diseases doesn't mean you ought to, right? Okay, so um, no water. No, and, and, and about the same number of people are without clean drinking water. And then in the United States, somewhere between 5 million and 13 million children are in families that go to bed every night with food insufficiency. They don't know where the next meal's coming from or their parents don't know. Right here. I mean, does that sound possible? And, and yet it is. So, um, what do we focus on then? Okay, we got billions of people without water. We got millions of people in our own country without enough food for their kids. And what, what is our attention focused on? Trans kids, right? As if we found where the evil lies, there's this minuscule part of the population that's already suffering from high suicide rates, terrible rejection from their peers, uh, a confusing life of their own, and the answer is not to show compassion and caring, it's to punish. And, and I've come across some, um, you know, sometimes you'll hear something one month and something another year and a couple of years and you hear a few things and they all kind of click together. Well, I was, I was listening to uh, some podcasts with people who know physiology much more than me, but apparently we all start off female. I, th I think that's the Y chromosome, but I, I get confused on that sometimes. And somewhere in the pregnancy, there are some changes that are uh, injected into half the kids, half the, the embryos, to change them into males. But what I never knew before is at the, neuro, um, sci at the, the neurotransmitter level, there's a mechanism that's constantly running in place to keep us from shifting back. Okay, there are animal species that uh, if the uh, male dies, and it's just females, and the species is going to die, the alpha female morphs into a male and takes care of some, some fish species. And there's some others, but I'm aware of that. So it occurs to me, a lot of stuff happens that we don't know in birth and stuff. And if there's this mechanism that has to be there, has to be operating to keep us from changing back into female, isn't it possible that something went awry somewhere in somebody's um, pregnancy? Not that anybody did anything on purpose, not that it was, a kid, you know, controllable, but isn't it possible that their claims of feeling like they are the wrong gender are genuine and would be extremely confusing and very distressing to a family? And so they already have a lot of heartache. So what's the point of, uh, of jumping on them and, and vilifying them and treating them as the other? And I was thinking about that because the last couple of few years, I've, I've had some trans kids in my practice, and it, it's, it's very difficult for them. And it's hard not to feel compassionate. But really, that's where the problem lies. Two billion people, no water, 13 million kids, no food. And that's what we're gonna focus on. And now that gun violence has elevated to probably the largest source of death for young people in our country, and the, somebody figured out the answer to the problem, not enough kids have high-powered weapons that they've, they've made a, a miniature version of the AR-15 with the same firepower, 
but the trigger guard and all the other sides of it, they sized it down so it's easier for kids to, to, to handle. Um, and I've heard the argument that if everybody was armed, people would be more polite to each other, right? You've heard that? Well, I've observed that the Aryan Brotherhood and the Crips and the Bloods and the cartels, when they get together, they're really not that polite to each other. <laughs> can, anybody see, can anybody see a disconnect here? Okay, so I got, I got those things out of the way. I, I did want to point out that in our teaching, we do believe that we all come from one, right? Yes. So if we all come from one, if these problems are happening to some of us, then they're happening to all of us. I'm not at all claiming to have the answers. I'm not at all claiming to even have the majority of the questions. But I do think we can do way better than this. Anybody disagree? Okay. So I've thought... Well, I had a platform, I wanted to get that off my mind because I think that we, in ignoring those, those subjects, we go into happy talk too much. And, and our teaching is not about pretending things are good when they're bad. It's knowing that we can change things to be better, right? Yes. So it's not about avoiding. Um, <clears throat> okay, so how can we get more pleasure in our lives? Anybody here interested in that? Okay, some of you remember Dr. Jackie Belzano. She was my first teacher here. And uh, one of her last talks, she asked a quest question that really stuck, really stuck in my mind. And I'm looking for a clock that used to be there just to stay on time, but it's apparently not there now. I should have put, well, I did find my phone. I just turned it off, but okay. Ah, oh, it is there, okay. Okay. Well, Jackie asked this question. When you are n not noticing yourself and you suddenly notice, pay attention to what you're thinking, your state of mind, when the wheel of you know, your mind comes around, you know, joy up here, fear down here, when it stops spinning and you notice what you're thinking, does your mind fall closer to the fear side or closer to the joy side? Because when she asked that question, I had to realize that much of my life, maybe most of my life, my underlying program was closer to fear than it was to joy. And check yourself out right now. What are you thinking? Are you, if you're, you know, habitually, are your inner thoughts supporting your hopes or your fears? Because a lot of times I find it's supporting my fears. Anybody else have that? Right, and, and part of that's biological. The, the brain has a negative bias. It's built in. That's how our early ancestors survived. 50,000 years ago, and that, our brain hasn't really changed very much in 50,000 years. 50,000 years ago, our ancestors had a lot of dangers, physical dangers. And it was much more important to remember where the lion was, even when the lion's not there, than it is to be appreciating a sunset or a good food or something like that, because you could never afford to forget about the lion if the lion was there. And so that would be a, a big issue. And we just have in, inherited that propensity to remember bad things more than good things. In fact, although most people report more distress or unhappy or unpleasant experiences growing up than happy, it's not really because there were more of them. I mean, for some people, there definitely were. But for a lot of us, it's because those negative experiences have a bigger impact in the brain. And... Um, and, 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 uh, and as we get to be teenagers, too, the brain tends to prune memories that are not activated very often in favor of new neurological connections. And that wasn't known until well, maybe 15, 20 years ago. But, and it's still, you know, being researched. <clears throat> so how do you do this thing of overcoming this negative bias and bringing more, um, more good stuff into your life? Well, another thing that's useful for pleasure, in, in addition to music, is humor. And anybody here like humor? Okay. And I was not here for Mother's Day, but I have a Mother's Day and a Father's Day appropriate joke. Anybody remember the comedian Elaine Boozler? <clears throat> she had a great line. You may or may not remember it, but she said, women will have reached equality when you can become bald and paunchy and still imagine you're attractive to 20-year-olds. <laughs> Anybody disagree? <laughs> <laughs> OK.
Okay, and then for Father's Day. Um, Junior went out one night, and I guess his family had a cabin in the woods or something, you know, vacation home, but they had an outhouse, and Junior thought it'd be real funny to push over the outhouse, so he tipped it over. And then later on, his father found out, and his father was really angry with him and was going to punish him. And he said, well, wait, Dad, you know, remember you told me about George Washington? Um, George Washington cut down the cherry tree, and when his dad said, did you cut down the cherry tree? He acknowledged, I cannot tell a lie. I did it. And his dad was so happy and impressed that he had uh, confessed to this and told the truth. He didn't punish him. And his father says, yeah, I know that story. I told it to you. And yeah, you're going to be punished. And he said, well, why? George Washington wasn't. He said, yes, but George Washington's father wasn't in the tree when he cut it down. (laughs) (laughs) When Jackie mentioned that... uh, question about how close life, you know, fear versus joy. I did a few calculations, and I I, I noticed that if someone lives 50 million minutes, which I think is close to 100 years, but I could be totally wrong because I I didn't really double check the math on my calculator, didn't go that high, and I I didn't have time to take off my shoes and count one, two. (coughs) So anyways, if you have 50 million minutes, and 25 million and one of those is in joy, and somebody asks you, how's life? Probably say, pretty good. And if 25 million and one of those minutes was in something other than joy, and they say, how's life? Eh, it's okay, it's a little hard, it's always pretty hard, whatever, it's okay, or, or really hard, right? Does that make sense? So how do you change that ratio? How do you overcome that? Because that was the question I had. Well, I'd spent way too much time. And, and I wouldn't say I was in fear. Let's say I was anxious. Anybody here get anxious? Anybody get concerned? Not afraid, though. I'm a guy. We guys don't get, right, Patrick? We don't get afraid. We don't get afraid, but sometimes we get anxious or concerned because we don't like to use the F word. <laughs> Women seem to be allowed to do that more, so this might be landing on your ears better than, uh, than ours. So... I would like to invite you to join me in a closed eye exercise, if you're willing. So does everybody feel okay with that? And if you don't close your eyes, it's okay, because some people have had experiences in life where bad things happen when they close their eyes. And, And I don't want that to happen for anybody or that to be triggered. But if you're comfortable, go ahead and close your eyes. And take a couple of minutes and picture the face or faces of someone or someone that you love unconditionally. It could be your kids if you got kids, or maybe your kids when they were younger. It could be a spouse, a partner, could be a close family member, a friend, could be pets. Just some sentient beings that you love unconditionally and place their faces in your heart and see them there. And then as you inhale, Just imagine you're inhaling unconditional love right into their faces. And do that. And then exhale. And donate that unconditional love back into the world. And repeat it. See their faces light up when you inhale in that unconditional love. You see their little faces. And then it's easy to generate feelings of unconditional love and generosity and compassion when we're thinking of people we love. So inhale into them and then exhale, donating that unconditional love back into the world. Because it's important to get into this state because when we're angry or fearful, it's literally impossible to consistently generate thoughts of compassion and caring and generosity and connection. And your higher thinking functions literally go offline. Because their ancestors, when they were running from the line, didn't have time to get out a legal pad and write out their options here. How's it going to be? So the ones who survived had developed a mechanism that the only thing you're thinking about is, I'm out of (laughs) here, nothing else. So inhale again, look at their little faces. And as you generate that unconditional love, Donate it back into the world as you exhale. 
and continue that process. And if you keep doing this, over time, you will actually be creating a measurable change in the energy pattern around you because our hearts are the largest generators of electromagnetism in the body. And it's not just a metaphor. It can be measured with uh, devices now up to a few feet away, but I believe our, our human heart, since we all evolve together, can feel that energy at a greater distance. So continue inhaling unconditional love into those little faces, and you can see their faces light up when you do that. Maybe your heart's face gets lighter and you can see some illumination from the reflection. And then donating that unconditional love right back into the world. And over time as you do this, and if you made it a regular practice, eventually by extrapolation, you could be influencing in a positive way the energy field around those people that you're viewing in your heart right now. So as well as being good for you, it's good for them. And I would suspect that for all of us, nothing gives more pleasure than thinking of good things happening to those people that we are visualizing right now in our hearts. So go ahead and indulge in that pleasure a little bit longer. And if you did this for 15 or 20 minutes, you would find yourself sliding into a meditative state that would bring you in harmony with our one source. And I would say that if more of us do this, we would address all of those other concerns I was talking about earlier in a much better way, in a more effective way, by remembering that love is always the answer. As Dr. Holmes pointed out that evil is the unintelligent use of intelligence. We are direct expressions of an infinite intelligence. <coughs> we are all thinkers in this intelligence. <coughs> As we think into this intelligence, we get results, objectified, measurable results. And so, I suspect that we would approach these problems in a way that really is in harmony with our, our parent center's mission, which is a world that works for everyone. Not just some of us, but for everyone. So when you're ready, you can bring yourself back into the room. Maybe look around and see that everybody's still here. It's good to still be here, because that means we're still alive. It's good to be seen. So, on that note, thank you for listening, and namaste.